coming but I think we can get started so I don't know I don't if the promotora was gonna come or not but we'll just close the door and people might come in and just if you can silence your phones you know that kind of thing that would be great and um, yeah let's get started All right. Well, welcome to Southern Caregiver Resource Center. Today's live stream is on the LGBTQ caregiver. And we are going to be talking about um, this community and how we can support each other and some of the issues and challenges that caregivers face. And I encourage our viewers online to uh, check out the other videos, but also to ask questions and for all of you to participate. And uh, let's get started. So we, uh, this is our topic for today, and as you know, every month we do a different topic on caregiving. And of course, being the organization that focuses 100% on caregivers, it's important to recognize that there are many different kinds of caregivers in our community. 
More specifically, what I'm going to focus on are these objectives. So talk about the LGBT community specifically to caregiving. Uh, explore, explore the chosen family's um, uh, effect on caregiving, as well as some of the challenges that individuals face in their caregiving role. So I know some of you mentioned that you are caregivers, and I know some of us have been caregivers or currently are caregivers. So if at any point you feel the need to um, kind of jot down our information, our contact info, you have our brochures for our friends online, you can visit our website, scrc.care, and get connected to our services there. Okay? All right. Let's get started. So what I want to share is a little bit of terminology for our community to understand that LGBT, LGBTQ is a term that is referred to all communities of people who identify themselves by this term. Now each letter represents a different word and as you can see is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning. So I think all of us have seen this term and you might see it a lot um, you know maybe different variations in some of the variations that you might see and this is something that is uh, more updated is the LGBTQIA and the LGBTQIA term is is a little bit more inclusive and it includes more non-mainstream sexual orientation or gender identity actually a lot of times you see this plus sign so that it includes even more people um, in, within this designation. So a little bit of historical context. We know that there has been a lot of discrimination in the LGBTQIA community, especially as it relates to stigma and isolation. And a lot of adults, especially older adults now, have faced this stigma, this um, you know, uh, discrimination throughout their lifespan. So now they're aging, and now they are here um, in this uh, place in their lifetime where they need these services. And all of their lifetime, they've been marginalized. So it is, they have this, you know, sometimes deep m distrust of the mainstream uh, institutions, services that are offered, and, and understandably so. I mean, up to uh, 1973, as a matter of fact, uh, homosexuality was considered a mental disorder. And it was even in, the, in their uh, book of psychiatry. And up to 2003, until 2003, in a lot of our states in the United States, uh, homosexuality was considered a crime. And so if you think about that, I mean, up to 2003, wow. that's so recent, right? So um, there is still a lot of stigma and a lot of distrust in these institutions. So. We know we're all aging, <laughs> right? I, I'd say we're becoming wiser. But um, as we see, especially in the LGBTQ plus community, there are about 2.7 million adults in the United States. Um, and this is an aging population. We all know, we've all heard of the silver tsunami and how we're living longer and people are living into like their 90s, uh, which is great but then what happens to the services that they need? And I think I, a lot of us can relate, and I, and I see yeah. you going like this, and your heads are gonna probably fall off, but yes. <laughs> so I, I agree that there's something that needs to be done as a, as a society that we need to address. Now, there are some unique challenges. Now, we all know that as caregivers, we have a lot of challenges, right, period. It's, it's not easy, um, you know, a lot of us who are in the sandwich generation, you know, working, have kids, and taking care of our loved ones, or, or friends, or family, it's not easy. And now you add all that I just talked about, right, the stigma, the isolation, the distrust, and now that becomes an even more unique situation for uh, the aging population. So what we are seeing now is a lot of these uh, elders, these seniors, are probably living alone. They're probably single. And um, that's where they find themselves in. So a lot of times, you know, we assume, oh, you have, you know, a partner, you have a spouse. And that's kind of a, a foregone conclusion, but not so much the case here. 
And some of the reasons that we see is that they are alienated from their family, right? Again, growing up, they might have been alienated and, and pushed aside from their own biological family members. And so then you start kind of making a life of your own. Maybe they, they didn't marry because marriage wasn't <laughs> allowed until 2015 uh, here in the United States. So then they probably don't have a partner and they probably, or a spouse, and they probably don't have children. So, so many times they find themselves alone for so many reasons. So we have here a term, and this is a term that we've come across in, in a lot of books, doing a lot of research, and it's called a family of choice. Now, you know, people don't walk around saying, my family of choice, <laughs> right? It's just, it's your family. It's the people that you, your network. Why we consider them your network? And we tell caregivers here, um, in, uh, here in San Diego, our, the organization that I work with, that your, your network of care does not necessarily have to be your immediate family. We have this idea that it has to be your siblings, your parents, your blood relatives, and it doesn't. It can be your neighbor, your cousin, you know, your, your friend, your best friend growing up, your church, uh, you know, membership. It really doesn't have to be your immediate blood relative. And the same thing applies to the LGBTQIA community. It can really be whoever you designate as your family, right? Your network of care. So what it is, it's really an extension, you know, this kinship approach to other people that are not necessarily your blood relatives. So, um, so this is just a term that I wanted to share with you because many times I think we assume, well, why don't you just have your sister help you? Why don't you just have your family help you? Um, it's not that easy. So um, there are about 34.2 million unpaid caregivers uh, in the United States. Now, for those of you who are caregivers, and just quick show of hands, how many millions do you get a year for being a caregiver? None? <laughs> Right? So we see that a lot of times caregivers just provide this out of the love, you know, for that person and to care for that person, right? I'm, I know I'm being silly here, but we don't get paid for being a caregiver. So now you find that with this population living alone, having that caregiver is probably non existent. So then, oh, that's how do I have a question? Oh. So then um, this is higher than what we usually see out in the community. So unpaid family caregivers, that is, that is a lot. Now what we are seeing is that with uh, LGBTQ plus uh, caregivers, usually they are caring for, the caregiver is caring for another person around the same age, the same cohort, the same um, population, the same uh, generation. Whereas uh, sometimes we're used to seeing a caregiver be younger than the other person that they're caring for, right? In San Diego County, the face of the average caregiver is a 49 year old woman working at least 20 hours outside the home. But for this community, it's usually their same age. So that's what's interesting that if you're in your 40s, and you're caring for your partner, you're caring for your neighbor, and that, na that person is in their 40s too, you probably are working as well, right? And if you ha are doing that, it's because maybe there is no family uh, involved. So um, now the second thing that we find is that you do see a lot of times um, members of this community who in the, in the past got married and they had children right and maybe they were closeted because it wasn't something that you talked about right you couldn't you couldn't be a man and not have children because well then what's wrong with you how come you don't have a a wife with kids or um, you know how come you don't have kids and you're a woman so there is a lot of discrimination obviously we're aware of that um, but then what you have is the the elder needing the care from maybe uh, a daughter right that they had in prior marriage and now they're caring for their parent. Um, you know, here's an example, a lesbian daughter caring for her aging mother. 
So what's unique, and I think this, is apl this applies to a lot of us, right? That, well, you don't have anything else going on, right? You're a nurse. You can just do that caregiving role. It's so easy for you, right? You don't have any kids. Just do it, right? You live closer to mom, right? Then just go ahead and take, you live with mom, just go ahead and care for her, right? So many times, um, it's, it's kind of that lack of consideration for that person that becomes the caregiver. But also, what if that person is in the, in the midst of developing their, professionally, right? What if they have a job and they're ascending, and all of a sudden, now they kind of have to put the brakes because, you know, they got to take care of that person. So um, this, is, this is also a challenge that we see in a lot of um, caregivers. And um, I don't know if that resonates. Do you know anybody? I mean, I know you were nodding in agreement, but um, your mom liked you best. <laughs> you got along with mom, so you just go ahead and take care of her, right? So, so we see this um, a lot. So some more challenges, right? Like if we didn't have enough. I just keep talking about challenges, but that's okay. We're going to find solutions. Um, Caregivers are more likely to be caring for someone else who is isolated. Now there are a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of situations where uh, the elder caregiver kind of goes back in the closet. And they kind of fear, well, you know, nobody else is going to take care of me. I'm by myself. I need to kind of have somebody else take care of me. So I'm just going to pretend so that it's easy for everybody else to take care of me because how, you know, I don't want that further isolation. Um, we, and I talked about the same cohort, and really, and this is a challenge, um, rarely recognizes the primary caregiver. So let's say I'm an elder, and I have no family, and I have no one to take care of me, and I live alone. And here you are, you know, this group of people who might be friendly to me, I don't know. So I'm going to take, I'm going to be a little bit hesitant, and so I might not come out and tell you my, my true identity. And so then you might say, oh, you know, here's this, you know, little lady, I'm going to take care of her, and, and, and that's great, but you might not be my relative. And then as time progresses, if some legal and, and uh, health care decisions need to be made on my behalf, who's going to do that? You're not even my relative. Right? So that's another challenge for a family caregiver. And that's what leads us to legal challenges. Right? Now we talked about marriage equality, right? In, in barely 2015. And until that point, uh, LGBTQ uh, elders or, or aging population couldn't really depend on a partner for their care. Now, if we take it a little bit more historically, you know, maybe they didn't have, they didn't uh, partner with somebody. So along their lives, they didn't have that dual income. And so now they didn't have children. And so maybe they were passed up on opportunities because, you know, they, they, others were mistrusting of them. And so now you kind of have this lower income versus a person that was maybe heterosexual and had a partner and had a family and kind of planned it that way, they had more opportunities later on in retirement was this person kind of stayed here. So what we see now is that a lot of times these seniors don't have the means, right? They don't have that retirement. They don't have the group of people that they can depend on. They didn't have the dual income, right? And they don't even have a partner that they can depend on. So this changes a lot. The whole marriage equality changes a lot, as, as you know, because then you have that legal right to be able to depend on this other person, right? And until now, um, if you went to the hospital, like the scenario that I just said, and you needed help and needed somebody to make that decision for you, you couldn't. Now the challenging thing, and I challenge, you know, I know California is very progressive and I think it's, it's wonderful that it's so inclusive, but I think we still have a lot of work to do. And in, uh, like for example, the Family Medical Leave Act, you, if you are not that spouse that, you know, 
child that you're caring for, um, you know, that, that parent that you're caring for, then everything else or everyone else does not, you know, you don't qualify. So we still have a lot of work to do, I think, as a, as a society to be able to expand the legal protection for just all caregivers, really, and encourage people to um, really think about those legal and financial documents that are so necessary. You know, we need to make sure that uh, especially caregivers who are, are caregivers in general, that they get the power of attorney health care directive, but especially in the LGBTQ uh, plus community that if they find themselves in that situation where they, their, their uh, family of choice is not a relative, uh, that they get them to get those legal documents so that they make decisions on their behalf. It's so important, especially if they're going to be dependent on them for help. So, and, and we offer classes on that, you know, we actually have a class and um, you can check online and you can see, but we talk about the healthcare documents and, um, you know, those, those important um, tools that you need as caregivers to care for that person um, that, that you love. So, some social attitudes uh, in terms of providing support, right? So, we talked about how a lot of times as a society we assume that everybody in our languaging is heterosexual, right? And that the services are designated and designed for um, partners who are heterosexual. So we really need to focus on that as, as a service provider because many times people s notice this and then go back in the closet. So if I'm only offering services for husband and wife, right, then, oh, then that's not for me. This organization is not for me. So we really need to make sure that uh, services are more inclusive and avoid that type of language. So um, we know that sometimes cultural competency is important. And we, we strive to do that. We strive to do that in the programs that we provide, in the services that we offer, even in the language that our staff speaks. Uh, we really focus on cultural competency. And there's always room for growth. I mean, there's so many different communities here in San Diego. It's a melting pot of communities. So uh, we need to make sure that we are able to extend a hand to those who need our services. And here at Southern Caregiver Research Center, we do that. We do our best to do that. And uh, like I said, we're always striving to do more and to reach more communities. Um, so maybe in the next 30 years, we can <laughs> keep doing that, right? Um, because the alternative would be that people become more guarded and then go back in the closet. And then we start all over with this vicious cycle, and we don't want that. So my challenge to social service providers out there, all of us, is that we focus again on our language. Um, maybe instead of asking, are you married, because certain states might still, even though it's legal, <laughs> right, these, there's still a lot of challenges with the implementation. We can say, um, are you in a relationship? Especially because it's not so much the, the whole homosexuality, heterosexuality, but not everybody's married, right? I mean, you might come in here with your friend that you're caring for, and you might not be in that relationship, but it's really that, that, um, that situation that is so different for so many of us. Uh, visually, you know, what do the pictures look like on the brochures or on the, on the website, right? We, can, we have a digital age now where we can just swap pictures. Well, maybe we put that, you know? Um, having a non-discriminatory policy, and then uh, calling agencies directly. What kind of services do you have for the LGBTQIA community? Um, I know that a lot of times people are scanning for these things, especially if you're in the LGBTQIA community. I want to know if the service that I'm going to access is friendly to me, right? Just like we do it with Spanish or any other language, right? Do you understand where I'm coming from? So that is my challenge to all of us. 
and then of course uh, offering some support services. And here we name these. Um, these are our uh, national uh, services and so we have the Family Caregiver Alliance they have a, a um, caregiving for our families and friends online support group for LGBTQ plus community uh, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association which I haven't even talked about right it's providing LGBT sensitive medical professionals see many times what happens is that members of the LGBTQ community they go to the doctor right because we should all go to the doctor but then you have service providers who are not uh, friendly to, to your needs. And so they might be dismissive or they might not tell you everything or they might be really short with you and, uh, and not understand where you're coming from. And so we have this group here that understands and can provide those services so that you get the medical attention that you need and not when it's too late because what's happening is uh, because of that fear because of that mistrust they end up not going to the doctor as often and then guess what they get sick and they go to the ER and nobody likes going to the ER <laughs> I don't care who you are nobody likes going to the ER so then um, you know it's it's that avoidance so here's some more uh, national level support and I want to leave these on a little bit longer because I want people to feel that if you might not find it here maybe it's easier physically maybe it's easier to start online you know now we have that uh, this resource that we can tap at home uh, or anywhere in your car or wherever and we can access some of these uh, resources and you can kind of start tooling around and, and checking for, for information that can be helpful. And of course, if you have friends who live out of town or live in another state, then you can refer them to these. So there's a lot of um, national level support programs. Now, self-care. <laughs> Every everything we do here at SCRC ends with self-care because we recognize, like you said earlier, right? You, you said thank you or you, you know, acknowledge that it's not easy for that person to take care of for you. And if you know yourself how difficult you can be, then <laughs> at least you recognize that. And, and that, was, that was really uh, funny. But um, self-care, it's not easy being a caregiver. It's not easy having to worry about somebody else constantly, their health, their well-being, any of their, um, you know, whatever daily life is. And then what about you? Who worries about you? You know, sometimes I think about this and, you know, I think all of us who are in this situation who are caregivers and who have been caregivers, um, it's always about everybody else. And then you end up getting sick but it doesn't matter. You still have to kind of get up and still keep doing the caregiving. So then you end up really tired and really overburdened and really overwhelmed and sometimes you end up getting sick even before the person that you're caring for. So we don't want that. We want to make sure that you incorporate some self-care. And if you have the support of the person that you're caring for who says, I know I can be a real, you know, <laughs> difficult person, then you could be more willing to say, well then, because you're so difficult, I love you, but I'm going to take a break. <laughs> um, and we provide a lot of services here that can help you. You know, we have respite, and I'll go over some of these um, later. But what I wanted to leave you with is the idea that in order to be an effective caregiver, you need to take care of yourself. And I say that also to our online friends because um, we really need to keep this at the forefront. Caregiving is not easy. I don't think it's ever going to get easy because as, as, even though we have so many tools, right, and we have so many places that we can go to, and now you're connected to here, so at least you know that we exist for you, that emotional turmoil, that, that emotional um, attachment that we have to the person that we're caring for, we want to fix it. We want to make it better. We want to make it go away. But sometimes we can't. And so we need to make sure that we remember that if I need, want to be an effective caregiver, I need to be at my optimal. And sometimes I need a break. And sometimes I need a mental break. <laughs> and sometimes I need a breather. See, there you go. <laughs> she says that lovingly. <laughs> so here are some of the services that I wanted to share with you, especially those of you who haven't 
um, connected to our services. Everything here we, that we do here is free. So if you are a family caregiver who live in San Diego County and are caring for the well-being of somebody else, and specifically that other person is over 18, so an adult with some sort of cognitive impairment like dementia, let's say, or you're caring for an elderly person, let's say over 60, who needs assistance with at least two activities of daily living, then we can help you. Live in San Diego County? Perfect. That's all. Just give us a call. What we'll do is we'll, we'll assess your situation. See, there's a lot of organizations that focus on the person with the disease, which is great, but we focus on the person behind that individual, 100%. So if you call us and say, I don't know what's wrong with this person that I'm carrying her, she keeps, let's say, repeating the same question over and over. She doesn't know who I am. I don't know why. Right? I know she's doing it to try to get me. Um, you know, whatever the situation is, you don't even have to have a formal diagnosis. Then we'll assess your situation. We'll figure out the best uh, way to, to help you. You'll get connected to a family consultant, which is a... Uh, either a licensed uh, clinical staff member or a master's level clinician. And so they're trained to identify your needs and your situation, how to help you best. Uh, let's say you want more information on what is this memory loss thing. I don't understand. Uh, we have a library upstairs. I don't know if you've connected upstairs, but we have a library upstairs. We have books. We have videos. We have DVDs. We have all kinds of stuff. Um, and you can check them out like a library. Yeah, so it's great. I check them out all the time. So you check out the books, you put in your name, and then you bring them back, and somebody else uses them. So it's wonderful. We have short-term counseling. And what's really great about that is because it's very specific to caregiving. Right? See, many times we don't identify that really the caregiving situation is what's causing all these other problems, right? Right? I mean, it's hard. So um, we provide you with six free sessions. So you can talk about anything. Yeah, we'll, we can talk later. Uh, legal and financial. You know, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And my boss used to say, one of my bosses used to say that. And um, because unless we are in that situation, we might not even know that we are going to need that service. So many times people say, well, I think I need to place my mom in a, in a community. It's really expensive. Do I need to sell all of my assets and her assets because how are we going to pay for this, right? So we partner with elder law attorneys. We partner with um, uh, law firms that specialize in elder care. So they can ask, you can ask them all your questions and we'll pay for that session. So have all your questions ready. <laughs> uh, respite care. So respite is just a break. It's a fancy word for a break. And who cannot use a break? <laughs> I can use a break right now. <laughs> All the time. So um, we have this program, and you might have the flyer already. It's called Together Care. It's a new program uh, that we have from um, here at SCRC, and she'll give you, yeah, she'll give you a flyer. So if um, many times a lot of families will send their loved ones to maybe an adult daycare facility, and it's, it's kind of pricey sometimes, or it can be. So this is an opportunity for you to only pay half of that. And so now you extend that hour to two. And that's really the idea to provide you more respite care. We have support groups, and I think you have a list as well. It's that green uh, piece of paper. And the support groups are all th throughout San Diego County, English and Spanish, with people who are in that same situation that you are. What do I do? This is what's happening. And many times what ends, it would, would, it, the outcome of these support groups is that you now have an extended network of care, right? People who are in that same situation. And you learn from each other. Education and training is what we do. And my team and I are all over San Diego County doing classes, workshops, conferences in English and Spanish on different caregiving topics. You can check them out on our website. You can sign up. We encourage people to sign up because then we have an idea of how much coffee to buy, <laughs> how many cookies to do. That's important. That's important. So here's an example of a flyer. Now, it's all in Spanish, so I understand if, if that's not the language that you prefer, well, then this is probably not for you. But um, well, there is a need, and that's why we did it all in Spanish, um, which we know we, we take that into consideration. 
Uh, employer resources. So anyone out there who has, um, who works at an organization, at a for-profit, at a at a place that could uh, benefit from us coming in during their lunch break and do lunch and learns, for example. We can talk about all these topics and the employees don't have to go anywhere. They can actually just take their lunch and we meet, we go to them. And so then that's an opportunity for them to get the resources that they need without leaving their place of work because we recognize that sometimes you go to work and then you go home, you don't have time to come to one of these classes. Right? And that's why we live stream these classes, so that you can always access them online, on your phone, on your iPads, you know, anywhere at, um, at any time. Reach to Caregivers is a program that is uh, for people who are caring for someone with Alzheimer's, dementia, or memory loss. And so it's very unique, very specific, and very powerful. Um, it's a series of classes, and at the end, and I know you have the brochures as well, at the end, people come out understanding what's happening, how to manage some of those behaviors, and of course, self-care. Self-care always. And then Operation Family Caregiver is a program that we have for military and veteran families who are caring for someone with either post-traumatic stress disorder, so PTSD, or TBI, traumatic brain injury. So if you know of anyone who might be in that situation, let us know because it's also a coaching model similar to the REACH where it's kind of working with a person one-on-one -on -one and really helping you through these challenges of caregiving. So these are, in a nutshell, all of our services. But of course, you know, you can visit the website, grab a brochure. Here's our contact info, and I leave that up for our friends. But you should have, um, it, all of our brochures should have our contact info. Obviously, you're here, so you know how to find us. <laughs> you found us. Um, but it, the website is, is a good way, because it's very interactive. We do also, um, live besides the live stream, we do podcasts, um, which you can hear on a monthly basis. And so there's a list online that you can access. We have one minute tip videos. Uh, so if you tell me, Martha, I have no time. I know you're telling me to watch this or to read this or to listen. I have no time. You have a minute? You can do this. <laughs> Just go online. Sometimes you're waiting at the doctor's office, right? Or in line at a grocery store. Just put on your little earbuds and, and uh, watch the, vis the video. And then last thing, because we depend, you know, we're a nonprofit organization. So we have a lot, we're actually the County of San Diego's biggest contractor for caregiver services. So they give us the funds, the support that we need to provide these services for free. But as you know, it's more than just that, right? We have all of these additional costs. So we depend on donations and the support of all of you. And that's why we put on these fundraising events. So we encourage you, this is one that's coming up and you have the postcard. It's a fun event, we'll have, it's a concert. So we'll have music and food and drinks and, and networking and meeting other people. Um, but it's a concert and it's fun. And if you or anyone else, uh, maybe your place of work would like to sponsor, we're welcome, you know, the opportunity for you to do that and we can place your logo and we can promote your organization and you can be our partner. Um, so that's, uh, that's it. Any questions? No, I'll just uh, email in myself. So oh, good. You guys do a silent auction, right? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes. You can make a donation so I can help it. Wonderful. See? It's about connections. So thank you so much to, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to our friends online. We really appreciate all of you watching. I don't know if there are any questions. No? Okay. And then for all of you to be, for being here, it's really a pleasure to be able to do this every month. So uh, we'll stick around if anybody else has additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.